Thank you all for coming. <clears throat> Readers of my new book, Dark Agenda, might wonder how a, an ex-radical agnostic Jew would come to write about the war to destroy Christian America. And this is kind of how it happened. Uh, when I was in the left uh, and uh, in the process of leaving it, once I discovered uh, the destructive character of the left. I saw, for example, that the left didn't care anything about the Vietnamese people that it claimed to defend when the communists took over and proceeded to slaughter two and a half million uh, peasants in Indochina. There were no, no protests. But when, once I saw its destructive character, I turned to an examination of what we had said about America. I, I had to look at America, the, the system that we set out to destroy, um, and, and re-examine it. In the course of this inquiry, I had a kind of epiphany. Thinking about the unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, something that we radicals cherished. I realized that the only reason the rights were unalienable, that is they couldn't be taken away, was because they were God-given. If government gives you the rights, government can take them away. Um, and government, as, you, as the declaration said, was just instituted to guarantee rights that were given by God. This was a simple idea to understand, but not so easy to embrace for an agnostic. I had to face the fact that without a belief in God, or respect for a belief in God, that is to respect the people who had created this country and their belief in God, the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness could not exist. Without respect, moreover, for the Christians who created this country, our rights have no foundation and cannot be defended. And that was just the beginning of my re-examination. Looking back at the history, 98% of the people who settled this country and created America were Protestant Christians fleeing religious persecution. Every element of our democracy, pluralism, inclusion, diversity, equality, and protection for minorities is Christian in origin, and more specifically, it's a direct product of the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation was a revolt against the Catholic Church. Before the Reformation, you could not go to heaven without going through the Catholic Church and its priesthood. They even sold indulgences. If you were, up, were stuck in purgatory, they would get you, get you to heaven. And that's because it was the true church uh, and anointed as such. But what the Protestant Reformation was about was the perception that not only the Catholic Church, but all churches are human institutions. It's like the inverse of what my late friend Christopher Hitchens um, said, he said, religion poisons everything. Actually, it's human beings that poison religion. Um, the Protestant reformers advanced two fundamental ideas. The first was the salvation, salvation by faith. And what that meant is that we are so flawed and as human beings and prone to evil that none of us deserves salvation and you can only be saved by a divine grace. This is the idea behind our fundamental, it's when, when they used to teach civics in school, what you would learn, that system of checks and balances. Why did the Protestant founders of America put in a system of checks and balances? Because they, they knew that the, the very people that they had created as or designated as the sovereigns 
were dangerous. And the people they elected to government were even more dangerous <laughs> because in addition to being flawed, they had a lot of power. Um, but the truly revolutionary Protestant idea was what they called the priesthood of all believers. And the idea there is that every individual confronts their creator one-on-one -on -one without an intermediary like the Catholic Church or the priesthood or ministers for that matter or any of the Protestant churches. This is where we get the idea that all human beings are created equal because they're equal in the eyes of their creator and they have to be treated equally by government which exists to serve them. This idea, this Protestant idea, the priesthood of all believers is what made America the leader in abolishing slavery in the world, in empowering women, and in creating a society that was inclusive and diverse. In the Protestant view, no church was raised above others, no pope or priest or minister had the authority even to define what it meant to be a Christian. Um, Thomas Jefferson, um, didn't believe in the divinity of Jesus, for example. Um, so th th this marvelous system that we have, which is about equality and inclusion and tolerance, comes right out of, uh, out of the Protestant Reformation, and there's no other group that could have created America, certainly not like Christopher and his atheist friends. Because the Protestants who settled and created America were fleeing persecution by religions that had been established by the state, the American founders made religious liberty the first liberty and the foundation of all our other liberties. Freedom of conscience is the most basic right we have. You have to be free to have whatever opinions you come to and then you have to have the freedom to express them. And if you can't have that, you can't defend any of your rights. It's the very basis of our, our democracy. The title of my book is Dark Agenda, The Left's War to Destroy Christian America. In the last 60 years, the anti-religious, anti-American left has conducted a relentless assault on believers and their beliefs suppressing religious liberty, stripping the public square of religious expression and memory, and in the process, removing the underpinnings of our democratic order. What inspired me to write this book was the realization that the left's hatred for Christianity is also its hatred for America itself. In 2008, they opened a uh, visitor center adjacent to the United States Capitol um, and spent $621 million constructing it. And it's, it's like a museum of our system. Uh, you know, the Constitution is there and other artifacts and documents. When it was open, however, all references to God and religious, the religious faith of the founders had been systematically edited out of its photos and historical displays. The lengths to which the designers went to expunge God from the visitor center and from the founding uh, is in remarkably petty but an extreme. They, they have a, um, an image of the Constitution and uh, yeah, there are the signers and over the signers in the actual constitutions, it says, in the year of our Lord, 1787. And they photoshopped it so there's no in the year of our Lord. <laughs> it's unbelievable, actually, what they did. The visitor center said that the motto, our official motto, uh, is e pluribus unum. No. It's in God we trust. 
And then they took a replica of the speaker's rostrum, the speaker of the house, which has the inscription in God we trust, and they took it out. It's not just the uh, visitors to the nation's capital who have had God and religion airbrushed out of our nation's founding, founding thanks to a series of corrupt Supreme Court decisions beginning in 1962, uh, children in our public schools are denied knowledge of the religious origins and foundations, not only of our nation, but of their freedoms. Outrageously, because of the court's decisions, this knowledge is now denied to school children by the Constitution itself. In 1986, there was a study of 60 textbooks used by 87% of public school children. And the study noted that, quote, the pilgrims are described entirely without any reference to religion. You can't tell them that the pilgrims were, were Christians. Um, the textbooks describe how at the end of their very first year, the pilgrims wanted to give thanks for all they had, which was the first Thanksgiving. But there's no mention made of the fact that it was God they were thanking. In the textbooks, you, you can, children can read that the Pueblo Indians pray to Mother Earth, but the pilgrims can't be described as praying to God. And never are Christians described as praying to Jesus. It's, it's, it's like out of Orwell. I mean, it's just unbelievable. This study summed up its findings in these words. There is not one story or article in all these books in approximately nine to 10,000 pages in which the central motivation or major content derives from Christianity or Judaism. This is the thing, while I always explain to people that conservatives have real lives. Uh, and leftists don't. They live to do things like this. So uh, conservatives are generally unaware of what's going on uh, behind the scenery. But if you, if you don't know where you came, where you come from, how do you know where you're going? That, we've robbed our children. Uh, and you, you wonder where how these millennials, you know, how they think the thoughts they think, robbed them of, of their foundation. They have no understanding of how everything, or what they enjoy in this country was created. And this is why the assault on religion has created a national crisis in our country, dividing us into warring camps whose fundamental views are not only in conflict, but irreconcilable. That's why people speak of the present situation as a civil war, which is what it is. There's not going to be a civil war with armies as in the 19th century because the federal government is way too powerful. The war is over who controls the executive branch. The first Supreme Court the decision to banish religion from the schools and eventually the public square occurred in 1962 and is known as Engel versus Vitale. Engel was a founding member of the New York chapter of the ACLU, which is a radical organization hostile to America and its religious foundations. The ACLU suit objected to a 23-word prayer that the New York Board of Regents had required students to say every day. Um, this is how the prayer goes. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee and we beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country, amen. <laughs> For 170 years, there have been prayer in the schools regular features of, of uh, a school day without a single constitutional challenge. This is stare decisis, the rule of precedent, which every time somebody mumbles something about Roe v. Wade, they bring up 
170 years without a challenge, and overnight they overturned it. And this, Engel and the ACLU lawyers claim that the innocuous prayer I just read you violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, which banned the state from establishing an official religion. Uh, when it went before the Supreme Court, seven unelected, appointed for life by politicians, lawyers, decided by a six to one vote in favor of the radicals and banning the prayers. In his lone dissent, Justice Potter Stewart pointed out the hypocrisy of his colleagues. Because the Supreme Court begins with this invocation, God save the United States and this honorable court. The idea that a 23 word non-denominational prayer established a religion is transparently absurd. But six unelected justices decided it wasn't. The Greek scientist Archimedes once said, give me a lever and a place to stand and I will move the earth. In the Supreme Court, a radical minority had found a lever that would circumvent the democratic process and allow them to change the world. And changing the world, that's what radicals are focused on. They don't care how they do it, what force they use, what laws they break, because it, the end is so wonderful. There were many democratic solutions to this problem of prayer in the schools. If atheist kids felt excluded by a non-denominational prayer, I mean, I went to school, I wasn't religious. Uh, it never bothered me. I mean, they read the Lord's Prayer in school. I was, I, I, I like those words, lead us not into temptation, but king power and the glory, the kingdom. <laughs> Whatever. If, if atheist kids felt excluded, you know, you go to the regents or the school board or elected officials and you find a way to accommodate uh, non-religious kids if they're offended. Really simple. But the left isn't interested in the democratic process. It's not interested in persuading people. It's an, interested only in forcing people to be good according to their lights and what they think is good. The left had found a branch of government which could change the practices of a nation overnight make the new practices the fundamental law of the land, and do it for all 50 states at once. How radical and anti-American were the plaintiffs who shaped America's future through the leverage of the Supreme Court? In the year after Engel versus Vitale, there was another case brought by Madeleine Murray O'Hare, America's most notorious atheist. Um, it was far more influential, and of course the ACLU was totally involved, claimed that Bible school readings, you couldn't read from the Bible in public schools, and that it violated the Establishment Clause. Murray was the founder of Atheists of America, and Life magazine called her the most hated woman in America, which she, she loved that uh, epithet. Why? because it made her a victim. And she understood that Americans are easily seduced by victims, as we all know. In fact, Madeleine Murray was a, an extreme leftist and a deceitful manipulator of public opinion. She went so far as to blame Christians for her father's uh, fatal heart attack. She had a, an elderly father who she was always fighting with. Um, and he had this heart attack. What happened was they had, uh, she assaulted him over the morning coffee with these words, I hope you drop dead, I'll dump your shrivel, shriveled body in the trash. And he went out to the A&P and at the counter he just keeled over and she blamed it on Christians. <laughs> The intolerant Christians did it. Just pr prior to launching her anti-prayer campaign, 
Madeleine Murray took her family to Europe, her two sons, where she tried to defect to the Soviet Union. Like I say, she was <laughs> just a communist. Seeing what a troubled individual this was, and she was really, I, I can't go into all of her craziness, but um, the Kremlin rejected her. <laughs> When she returned to the States and prepared to position her son as a victim of intolerant Christians, she asked him, what, he was 14 at the time, and we know all this because he wrote a book um, <laughs> exposing her. She asked him what he felt about prayers at his school. He told her he didn't mind them. So she said, don't you understand what is going on yet? The United States is nothing more than a fascist slave labor camp. That's familiar words, I guess. Run by a handful of Jew bankers in New York City. The only way true freedom can be achieved is through the new socialist man. I can just hear these words coming out of Cortez's mouth. Russia is close, but not close enough to freedom, or they would have let us in. <laughs> The Soviet communists were smart enough to see that Murray was a malicious crackpot, but not the US Supreme Court, which with one lone dissent voted to impose her will on all Americans and thereby suppress religious liberty, which is the foundation of all our freedoms. The next two Supreme Court decisions engineered by the radicals were even more fraudulent than the prayer decisions. They led directly to the profound chasm in our society today. The fraudulent legal argument was common to both cases. It was an invented right to privacy in the Constitution that the Planned Parenthood lawyers devised. Um, the other case had to do with contraceptives. Uh, but it was the 1973 decision in Roe v. Wade that led to the nation-breaking political divisions that confront us today. This is the source of the split that has become a civil war. The suit was the work of the lawyers at Planned Parenthood and AACLU who support. They were brought into the case by, I'm not making this up, at a University of Texas uh, in Austin chapter of Students for a Democratic Society, the 60s most famous radical group. Once again, the radicals chose to bypass the democratic process. You go through the legislatures, you have to persuade people. The whole system that the founders set up was meant to force people to compromise and get along. They circumvented that entirely so they could invoke the tyranny of nine unelected, life appointed by politicians, lawyers, who voted the, the right to uh, make, kill children in the womb the fundamental law of the land. The legal basis for Roe was this imaginary constitutional right to privacy which Planned Parenthood lawyers had invented to justify their radical agendas. Even if the Constitution, and I'll tell you what the radical agenda was, Margaret Sanger, a lunatic leftist, um, believed that people should be bred like animals. And there were all these defective people, and among them for her were minorities, blacks in particular, uh, inferior people, and they, should be cut out first by using contraceptives, and then if you fail to do that, uh, by abortion. Uh, that, that's what was behind this whole thing. Even if the Constitution, however, contained a right to privacy, and it doesn't, it doesn't mention men and women. I don't know if you know that. I, I just saw, yesterday, Cory Booker said that he referred to the bigotries in the Constitution. The Constitution doesn't use words like black and white. It doesn't talk about races. Uh, it's people just make things up. But anyway, um, even if it did contain a right to privacy, which it doesn't, it made no sense as a decision. 
as Justice Rehnquist said in his dissent, there's nothing private about an abortion. There's a woman, there's her doctor, and what's unmentionable is there's also an unborn child. Uh, the pro-abortion movement, uh, its slogan is uh, the right to choose, pro-choice. But restrictions on abortions are not restrictions on a woman's right to choose as such. Unless she is a victim of rape, a woman makes a series of choices before arriving at the decision to kill a child. First to have sex, then with whom to have sex, then whether to have unprotected sex or not, or if there's an accident, uh, to use the morning after pill. Those are all choices that are made before the woman comes to the final choice, which is whether to, even if you don't want the baby, or don't feel that you can take care of it, find it uh, a loving mother who will take care of it, or kill it. Roe v. Wade represented a fundamental break from the existing fabric of American life. It was imposed overnight in every community in America, and without the consent of the inhabitants of those communities, the most anti-democratic thing you can possibly imagine. Actually, there's a, a, a liberal just wrote a book about the Supreme Court calling it the, the most dangerous institution, which it is. That's, that's my view of it. I mean, it just hangs on some president gets to appoint uh, these lawyers. Um, and it was imposed, of course, the decision is then imposed on the people who are supposed to be sovereign. But they're not, they're not sovereign when whatever it is, seven or nine unelected lawyers make the decision. This fraudulent, tyrannical Supreme Court decision split the nation in two. Its assault on traditional communities led directly to the creation of the religious right. Until Roe v. Wade, evangelicals in particular were very skeptical about being involved in, po in politics. Their focus was on the next world rather than this one. And uh, you know, I think any sane human being looks at politics and says, yeah. <laughs> want to be involved. But they were thrust into politics out of, you know, sheer concern for their self-defense. All the major political institutions of the religious right, the moral majority, focus on the family, American Family Association, they were, they were created within two or three years of the Roe v. Wade decision. When the Democratic Party, of course, when the Democratic it's a, really a totalitarian party. There's not much, you don't, you don't see a lot of Democrats doing what the um, Susan Collins and Rand Paul and Republicans do, standing up against their own majority. You don't see that. Um, when they embraced Roe Ro v. Wade, um, the pro-abortion decision, they made it impossible for, there, there, there is one, Bob Casey, the senator from Pennsylvania, is pro-life. Um, but what they did was they drove the Catholic, their Catholic base out of the party. And the Catholics became part of the religious right. And Protestants and Catholics um, <coughs> united on these issues. And they created a political force that first elected, and Roe v. Wade was 73. In 1980, they elected Ronald Reagan, and in 2016, they elected Donald Trump. The venom of liberals towards religious people is the product of a derangement parallel to the hatred both of Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump. It is manifest in the attacks on religion by the new atheist movement, whose spokesman, of course, the, 
The most entertaining one was Christopher Hitchens. But its chief spokesman is Richard Dawkins, the scientist. This is what Dawkins has written in contempt of religious people. Quote, religious ideas are irrational. Religious ideas are dumb and dumber, super dumb. This is the same wackiness that we see in the claims that President Trump is a white supremacist, a Russian agent, and unfit for office. Yet every, every creator of the scientific revolution, Pascal, Galileo, Newton, Copernicus, even Darwin, believed in a divinity and was inspired by this belief. Dumb, really? Why is, the war, why is the left at war with religious Christians? For the same reason leftists are at war with America. <coughs> the democracy Christians created on the basis of Christian ideas. Christians believe in the uniqueness and sanctity of the individual soul. They believe in free will, and they believe in original sin, in the flawed nature of human beings. It's our flawed nature that makes the utopias of the left, communism, socialism, social justice, impossible to achieve and monstrous to pursue. Free will means that individuals are accountable for their actions, not races and genders as the social redeemers claim. Leftists, so-called liberals, progressives, communists, social justice zealots, they're all the same. All are reactionary adherents of the fourth century heresy named after its author, Pelagius, who was a Christian monk. The Pelagian heresy is the most destructive ideology in all of human history. Pelagius believed that people are born good and that the sins they commit are against their true nature. Therefore, he believed that if people would only resist temptation and be good Christians, be true to their nature, they could create heaven on earth and do it without a divine intervention or grace. Progressives are the modern followers of Pelagius. Progressives believe that people are born good and society makes them bad. Well, who makes society? <laughs> they believe that if people will just choose to be politically correct, true to their nature, or if the state can coerce them into being politically correct, we can achieve a world of perfect equality, justice, and peace. These are the same seductive lies that led to the murder of more than 100 million people in the last 100 years. They were killed because they stood in the way of totalitarian perfection and were therefore condemned as politically incorrect. Pelagius' antagonist was Saint Augustine, who was in a way the godfather of modern conservatism. Augustine argued that sin is integral to human nature that we all share in Adam's original sin, wanting to know evil as well as good, eating of the tree the, from, of the knowledge of good and evil, and aspiring to be godlike and to create new worlds. You remember the serpent in the garden tempts Adam and Eve, saying, if you eat of that tree, you shall be as God. <clears throat> and that's every leftist fantasy. They're going to recreate the world. You can, what is the Green New Deal? <laughs> well, it's overnight. We'll just print it out. We'll print money. We'll force people to give up their cars. They don't say it. They'll force them. But you think you can get people to give up 300 million gasoline engine cars without creating a police state? I don't think so. This is why human beings corrupt movements for social change. This Cortez woman is already, she's violated the election laws, she's violated the house rules, and God knows what else. This is why human beings corrupt movements for social change and corrupt government 
as surely as they also corrupt society. Because it is human nature to corrupt. It is human corruption that dooms all utopian schemes that aim to repair and redeem the world. A feat that only a divinity could accomplish. Of course, for the Jews who are not, um, are not really God-fearing, they're more Democratic Party-fearing, they have the, the phrase is tikkun olam, we're going to repair the world. Lots of luck. The problem is, not only can't you repair it, but in the course of trying to repair it in a cosmic way, you, you cause unimaginable human misery. The battle we face today is one episode in a war as old as creation itself. It is a war that arises out of the human spirit, which is born to evil but it, which is also capable of great beauty and great good. Our battle is for our lives and the lives of our children and for this great country, which is unique among the nations and well worth saving. Thank you. start with questions. Carl gets the first question. Uh, thank you, David. You mentioned Judaism, and you mentioned the Democrats kicking the Catholics out of the party. Do you think that the recent failure of the Democrats in Congress to be able to rebuke anti-Semitism specifically will drive many Jews out of the Democratic Party? I'm, I'm not, I hope so, but I'm not holding my breath. Could you comment on this whole Well, thing? <laughs> the, the, some wit once said that Reform Judaism, which is the least orthodox of the Jewish denominations, is the Democratic Party with holidays. <laughs> <laughs> That's their religion. So. Getting people to give up their religion is not easy. I mean, uh, I wrote about it actually in Radical Sun. Uh, kind of the darkest day of my life up to then was when I realized that everything I believed was hooey, was false, and led to evil. And I just, the world went black in front of me over it. And it's because your, your identity is invested in this idea you're saving the world, that makes you very important. So I don't know that, that uh, the Democratic Party is an anti-Semitic party. It's embraced the terrorist caucus, Ilan Omar. Uh, he's doing fundraisers for Hamas organizations, for terrorist organizations like CARE. I forget the name of the other one she did it for. Um, Tlaib. These people are our enemies. Um, and they, they're obviously very powerful. I mean, Nancy Pelosi, who is a despicable human being, but a very smart a political leader, is impotent, and she can't control them. And I think a reason is that the incredibly corrupt and racist Black Caucus uh, is behind um, this group. Of course, I will get into a lot of trouble for saying this, but that's been the story of my life. <laughs> um, and uh, Democrats can't win anything without the black vote. So I don't see a lot of change there. I, I'm amazed. I mean, I, you know, I, I mentioned Cory Booker, who's an idiot. I mean, that stupid statement about bigotries in the Constitution. But I mean, I could go on and on about Booker. But it's true of all the leading Democratic candidates. I'm, you know, appalled. 
uh, that anybody could take these people seriously, whether it's Kamala Harris or, or any of the, or Pocahontas. <laughs> <laughs> they lie all the time and transparently and without any regard for the fact that there's all this television tape which shows that they're lying. I, so anyway, I'm not an optimist. Thanks. I'm hoping enough people, I'm, the independence is different. Uh, I, we mentioned the Jews. Like I say, it's their religion. Deracinated Jews are leftists. Deracinated from their religious roots. Hi, David. Um, it's fairly well known, at least among you know conservatives, that uh, the KKK recruiter and Grand Wizard Robert Byrd and Al Gore's father, whatever, uh, filibustered and tried you know the civil rights civil rights bills, and that Eisenhower started them. But but and we know that that were, it were it was British and American Christians that basically led the anti slavery anti slavery movement or started the anti slavery movement. Were there any prominent Democrats in history that that, that are associated with, that we would know they're associated with the, the, the civil rights or anti-slavery movement? Well, I think the, the civil rights movement's Democratic Party was involved in. Um, you know, I, Martin Luther King was rather conservative, but but the people right. around him. I mean, him, he's, it, it's, it's up to, uh, the it's unknown whether he was yeah, Republican no, or Democrat. I mean, you know, uh, I, I think the left has contributed to the civil rights movement, and, and it was fine until it was taken over by uh, two racists, Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton. Right. But I was really talking about the beginnings, more the beginnings of the slavery movement, that the Christians are not given the, uh, the, given mean, the credit for starting it. I, I, I'm, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm, okay. Maybe William Lloyd Garrison was a Democrat. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Hello, David. Hi. May God continue to shower blessings on you. I interested when I think of the issue of Marx and Muhammad, I see a fusion, and I see there's they're the same monster wearing different masks, and I think we see this very clearly now. It seems as if the only alternative, because we're dealing with we're dealing with Marx and Muhammad, we're dealing with Nazism, fascism, communism, socialism, Hezbollah, ISIS, it's all the same thing. It seems like the only possible alternative is the teachings and the theories and the morals of Moses. And I think in, as a conservative community, that needs to be publicly and forcefully reaffirmed. I wonder what your well, thoughts are. I, 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 maybe I didn't make this clear enough. To me, the two sides, and, and, and this struggle goes back, it's a story of the Tower of Babel, people trying to build a tower to heaven. Um, and I've said before, I think that the first chapters of Genesis uh, contain all the wisdom you need to understand what's going on. Um, uh, you know, the original our original parents, so to speak, uh, were in paradise. And it was better than socialism. <laughs> you didn't die, the true fruit fell from the trees, there was no pain in childbirth and so forth and so on. Uh, but in, or, in order to enjoy that, there was one thing that you shouldn't do. And of course, human beings are ornery. And that was the one thing, it's like, you know, when you're on a diet and you, 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 the only thing you can't eat is carrots, that's all you want. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the perversity of human nature. And uh, people who think, who invent this thing called society as though it's not a reflection of the people that create it. Um, uh, that's the external um, devil, as it were. Um, they're very dangerous people because they think that they can be like God, uh, act like gods. And what's more dangerous than that? The, the more beautiful the idea that you um, think that you're advancing, the, you know, the, the bigger the crimes you'll commit to get there. So, and uh, on the other side are people who understand it's, it's hard 
you know, the world, there's a lot of cruelty in this world. Um, and it's going to be there forever. And you try, I mean, you know, like Voltaire said, you tend your own garden. You try to affect the people who are close to you. You try one on one to help people. But you can't change it cosmically. You can't. This is, it's like with the environmentalists. I mean, you can't control floods. You can't control there's a fire in wherever it was, Paradise, California. Nothing you can do about that. But we're in control of the climate of the whole planet. I mean, come on. <laughs> okay, we've got time for one last question. I uh, just I have three questions for you. Uh, you mentioned, <laughs> they're, all pretty, they're all pretty short answers, though. You mentioned leftists, and up until about two weeks ago, I used to think leftists and liberals were the same thing. I listened to a five-minute uh, video on the Prager University and by site, Dennis, he was and saying leftists it yesterday. and liberals are not the same thing at all, if you could speak to that a little well, bit. And then my second question well, is, well, you well, mentioned, well, hang on, hang on, I'll, 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 I'll finish. The agnostic part, you mentioned you're agnostic, I can see you have a lot of knowledge of Christianity. It sounds like, I'm wondering if you're still an agnostic or if you're, uh, you know, uh, orthodox Jew or if you're a Christian. And then my third question is the Federal Reserve, you know, and the families like, um, Rothschilds, Goldman Sachs family, J.P. Morgan Chase. What percentage of the money that we see that the left has, which is massive, do you think comes from the Federal Reserve in these families? I can't Thank answer you. the last question. <laughs> I forgot the first question already. No. <laughs> the first question is the leftist and liberals. And yeah. The Can you explain liberals, the difference a little bit? If not, the I'm only sure. liberals in America today, aside from Alan Dershowitz, are conservatives. Yeah, there are no liberals. What liberals? Le leftists. Where, where, oh, Joe Lieberman is another. Leftists liberal. are into identity politics, so they're racist. Liberals are not. Leftists are into uh, identity global, politics. Want a global world, whereas uh, the uh, liberals want nations. The liberals are very much. Uh, you know, I, I, it goes on and on. I'm just. Identity politics is racism. And, uh, and liberals aren't racist, but of course they are. are. <laughs> Everybody who calls himself a liberal today, I'm with, with certain exceptions, I'm, I'm sure that Alan and Joe Lieberman are not, are, are racist. You, you, yeah, a lot of them. Where were the liberals, you know, attacking those Democrats as they lynched Kavanaugh on the basis of this pathological liar? Uh, Christine Blasey Ford's uh, accusations. Where, where were even, where, where was a Republican who stood up and said, we shouldn't even be talking about something that happened 30 years ago between two high school kids at a party with alcohol. And on, but on the, uh, there, there are no liberals. And on the, oh, like, and, and the, anyway. on, the, on the agnostic question, where would of you, course, where, I'm an agnostic. Okay, you're still agnostic. Say, and the third question: What about the Federal Reserve and those families? I don't know anything about the Federal Reserve. <laughs> oh, I thought you were talking about them. Over. <laughs> I know. Well, that, we're good. We're I done. Think, Mark, did you have a last question or a comment? Okay, we're gonna have one last question for Mark. Uh, I gotta get to an airport. We're done. There's a, a seven word phrase that may cause many on the left to become ap apoplectic. It's very simple. Does your baby deserve the death penalty? That's it. Thank you. Well, I mean, there's, yeah, I mean, it's what I said. There's so much obfuscation. Basically, the pro choice movement is a movement to give women freedom from responsibility for their choices. That's what it's about. If, if you take responsibility, I mean, you know, and life is difficult and takes a while to learn things. I mean, I've, I hate the word evolved. <laughs> I've changed my views a lot on abortion. Um, when, when I was a kid, it was like, yeah, you couldn't have an abortion after the first trimester. That was, and I, I kind of stuck with that. Um, but uh, you know, I've changed my views, especially when you see once you pull the restraints from people, the moral restraints. Now you have the Democratic Party endorsing killing 
born babies. I, mean, I never thought I'd live to see something like that. So there's no bottom. Um, I think it was, I can't remember the exact quote, but Reagan who said that we're one generation away from barbarism and we have to fight this battle in every generation. And uh, I think, you know, we're on the brink of the dark ages if we lose these battles now. Uh, I, I also think that, that we're going to win them. 